Okay, hi, my name is Jess Roman, and I'd like to welcome all of you to today's Berlin Epidemiological Methods Colloquium talk. We are very, very excited about today's talk and wonderful speaker joining us. Uh, but just first of all, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, we're the BEM, and we meet the first Wednesday of the month at 4 p.m here on Zoom webinar, I should say 4 p.m. Berlin time. You can, of course, join from wherever you're located in the world. We're happy to have you here. And in addition to these talks, we're doing a journal club, which is the third Wednesday of the month. You can find all of the information about our talks on our website, bemcolloquium.com. And now after this short advertisement, I would like to introduce today's speaker, we're very excited to have Sonia Bundar with us. She's working at the Robert Koch Institute in the Department of Infectious Disease Epidemiology, specifically the surveillance unit. And we always like to tell a little bit about uh, the speaker's trajectory getting into the field of epidemiology. So Sonia, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but she started actually, she's from the Netherlands and got a bachelor's degree in health sciences, I believe also a master in health sciences focused on public health and infectious disease, and then got a PhD in focused on global health and an additional master's in applied epidemiology, or she's working on that now, if I'm correct. Maybe Sonia, you can tell us a little bit more about your path. Um, but we're here today also to talk about social media. So for those of you who are on social media, please feel free to use this hashtag, SoMeForEpis. I'm sure Sonia will mention this more during her talk as well, if you'd like to tweet something about the talk. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to you. So thank you so much again for your time, Sonia. Well, thanks very much for this great introduction. And I'm very pleased to be here. And thank you all for joining online. Um, it's quite on topic, actually, that we're meeting virtually today. Um, because we're going to talk a lot about digital interaction and I'm sure we're all sick and tired of digital interaction and longing for some more face-to-face uh, -face time. Um, but I hope to, um, yeah, maybe inspire or also discuss a couple of topics uh, around social media in the field of public health, which I'm active in. Um, Sonia, before you get started, sorry to interrupt, mm -hmm. I just totally forgot to mention we have a Q&A button in this webinar. So if you have questions um, during the talk, please use that button. If it's something very urgent, um, we will just ask the question ourselves during the talk. Otherwise, we will have a discussion um, following the talk. So please do stick around for that. We also had some of you expressed interest um, in being panelists. So we would like to promote you so you too can get your faces up here on the screen. Um, so we'll promote you as panelists so you can then be more active um, in the discussion so you're not always just seeing our faces and we will not record the discussion portion of the talk. Okay, now for real, Sonia, <laughs> turn it over. All good, all good, all good. I'm, I'm all good with the interaction um, part. Um, so you've already heard a little bit about my background, which is indeed in health sciences and epidemiology. And um, being based at the Robert Koch Institute is de definitely an interesting time right now, also when you spoke about, you speak about social media. Um, so even though um, I started talking on the subject about two years ago and, and looking into it a bit more as, uh, as a personal interest actually, by the time I completed my PhD, I thought, okay, this is time to speak up as a scientist and take my responsibility and communicate science because I think it's very important. So I feel very passionate about, about this. Um, but of course, um, this talk will be quite biased to what my personal interests are, what my personal experience is. It's impossible to pack everything you can say about social media and public health into a one hour talk. Um, but I do try to keep some sort of overview of some key themes. Um, I'm also a millennial, which was probably also quite um, a big bias for this talk because I kind of grew up at the time where social media started. And uh, I think it's been amazing knowing what it's like to dial into, you know, the internet through a phone line and kind of see it progressing to where we are right now. Um, this um, talk kind of initiated two years ago when I was a, an EPIAT fellow, so in field epidemiology trainee at the Euro, uh, European Center for Disease Prevention and Control. And we organized a two day workshop on this topic, social media for public health. And for me, this was really the time where um, the topic kind of 
migrated from my hobby sphere to the more professional sphere. It was a very um, cool way to see everything coming together and which I thought was particularly interesting was to see that people who were relatively junior to the field of public health tend to have quite a lot of experience in this field of social media, while those who were more senior in their field of public health tend to be a bit more inexperienced um, in the field of social media. So it's a very interesting way to kind of exchange experiences and, um, and work on that all together. And that time we could still actually meet into a room, but we also tried to really um, mix up media a little bit, like I'm, I'm showing out now with tweets about the workshop and um, during the workshop as well. At that time, when you think about social media, this was kind of what we're looking into. Uh, people on their phones and public transport, doing social events. This is really the picture that a lot of people had in mind. Well, nowadays, it's actually a bit more like this. Um, at the same time, we're still using the same platforms and we're still uh, yeah, kind of trying to connect to each other, but the context, context have ch has changed a little bit. But what are social media exactly? So before we dive into a lot of things that you know, might be a bit unfamiliar or familiar to many, um, it might be good, especially because this is a BEM talk, which is usually a lot more hardcore when it comes to methodology to at least come up with a definition. So lucky enough, there is a mesh term for this. So if you go to PubMed uh, since 2012, there's a mesh term for social media. And it's as follows. It says platforms that provide the ability and tools to create and publish information access via the internet. And these are actually three common characteristics which I think are very important to keep in mind. One is that the content, it's user generated. So everybody can basically generate this content. The second one is a high degree of interaction between the creator and the viewer. So compared to uh, more traditional media, there's a lot more dynamic going on. And the third one is also very important is that it can be easily integrated with other websites and other platforms. But what are these platforms? So still, okay, we've got this definition and we might think about uh, Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, but there's also YouTube, there's TikTok, there's LinkedIn, there's Google+, Plus. there are so many different accounts. And when I uh, started using social media, Amazon was still a thing, you could chat through that, ICQ was still a thing, um, uh, MySpace, there are all these different types of platforms um, that you can use. And it really depends on what you're looking for and who you are, and um, there are just too many to all uh, really uh, be active on it, but there's also absolutely no need to do that. Um, there are also specific uh, platforms for scholars. For example, Google Scholar is a more dynamic page where you can you can share your content. The Orchid ID is a very good identifier to um, to link these things up. There's ResearchGate. There's Publons for for peer review um, tracking. But you can also think about things like WhatsApp or Telegram or Signal or Snapchat, but also podcasts or Slack or Discord. I, I might name a few that are unfamiliar, but there's just so many different platforms. And it's also good to keep in mind that it's not just Facebook or it's not just Twitter, it's not just Instagram. It's really about digital media, which will, I'm absolutely sure, but in two years time, there will be new platforms. And of course there were smaller and, 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 and bigger platforms. For example, Facebook is quite big and there's a lot of discussion about the monopoly of Facebook, also buying these smaller platforms, um, but everything is changing all the time. Um, it always feels a bit funny to do this, but um, we talked a bit about integration and I just wanted to use my own personal page as an example to um, let you know what this integration actually means. So this, for example, is my Twitter profile. This talk will be a bit biased towards Twitter because that's my go-to uh, platform. But you can see here, I've got my uh, profile uh, all lined up and I've actually tagged my employer, the RKI. So you can see and quickly link to the RKI to, to take a look over there. Importantly, I also um, put out there that the views are my own, which are not necessarily the one from my institute, which um, yeah can be something that a lot of uh, companies or institutes will require you to do, even though you can still promote um, information or, or views that are related to your institute. And it's also good to keep in mind that you can never really separate yourself from the institute. So if I would, I don't know, say something 
very extreme, people will still interpret it as uh, being from someone at the RKI. I also link it to my personal web page. This is something I made really with the, um, through uh, our software, I can highly recommend it. It's really, really not that complicated. Um, and there you can actually link up to even more social media uh, platforms. So I've got it linked up with uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, Google Scholar. So you can see things are already kind of uh, connected to each other. I pinned a tweet around this talk right here below, and then I link again to them. So you can see how flexible it is. In a way, it's very familiar and it's uh, a bit parallel to what we are used to in uh, more traditional media. And in fact, that you can uh, think about newspapers or platforms for information sharing, but it's just a lot easier and more accessible and very easy to, to generate these content because it's all already there. You only have to kind of write things down and link things up a little bit. But what is one of the things to keep in mind? Um, we talked a little bit about the basics of social media, but then the question is, of course, what are you actually doing on social media? And uh, you can think about you as a person, but also as a project. For example, you might have got a, a grant for a certain research project, or you've got a personal project you're very keen on, on communicating about, or maybe you're uh, communicating on behalf of your institute. So it's good to keep in mind who am I when I go online? Like, wh what do I represent? What do I want to do? And on the other hand, um, who and where are they? So to whom am I communicating? These things are quite similar to traditional media that you always want to keep your ta target audience in mind. So are you communicating to your colleagues, for example, or are you communicating to the general public or are you actually communicating to a very specific niche group of people? Um, social media are actually quite good to, to target niches as well. Um, as I mentioned before, now at the RKI, I used to communicate things that would have been of interest for uh, a very specific niche of people who are interested in infectious disease epidemiology, but these things can now really um, blend into each other. And, and this is also, I think, a strength uh, of social media. There's this very nice paper by uh, Big et al. It's quite, well, it's not really old, but it's from 2013. And I think they have a really nice overview of uh, what you can do on social media. Um, because also this can really differ on, on your preferences and your aims and, and the amount of time you want to invest. So you can uh, create new content. You can uh, think about, well, this is something uh, that's not really, not really covered in the media already. And I want to um, share pictures or I want to uh, explain things or uh, provide information. Or you can build for a community of people that you're not really interested in the content, but really linking people up. This is also something Facebook has always been very uh, vocal about that they really want to bring people together and share. Um, another way of dealing with it is curation, so that you're not really uh, generating content, but you're really picking uh, things together and, and gathering it in one place where people can always look for that type of, uh, yeah, that, that type of, of, of interest, for example. And this is, of course, also linked to um, the amount of time you want to invest. So if you think about, okay, I'd like to do a little bit um, of work on, on social media, but I don't have a lot of time. You can also work with your uh, organization and your communications team. And they're usually actually very, very keen on you to, um, and they, they ask you to, to provide some information or ideas or content that they can then share uh, externally. Um, one of the first things I did when I started working at RKI, which was in 2018, is I went to the communications office and I said, well, I really like to um, communicate things, but what's your policy? And, um, in the end, I actually got a lot of information or even uh, access to a lot of uh, images that I could use for uh, a week of rotation curation, which I took part of. This is where you actually tweet from one platform for one week. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of common fears usually with the communications team of your institute, but usually if you um, contact your, your communication department, they're quite keen on you to, uh, to be in touch and, and talk about what's, what's good or interesting to share. You can also blog for guest bloggers or contribute to other things, but depending on what you want to do, um, you can get involved. Uh, I put some hashtags here in the middle, Epi Twitter and Academic Twitter. These are very big um, communities on Twitter uh, for academics and epidemiologists, which I highly recommend checking out if you're not aware of them. So these were the basics a little bit, and then comes real life. 
many of you might know this um, PhD comic about the science news cycle. And it starts off right at the top and uh, you've done your research and everything's wonderful and you put a lot of effort and thought into exactly this, this, this result you wanted to communicate in this context, in this population uh, with all these limitations. And then there might be a press release um, which might be picked up by uh, journalists, maybe by some bloggers, uh, maybe on the news. And in the end, sometimes it really transforms into something completely different. This is something that um, can take place with the advent of social media in, at a much faster pace, but it's also interesting to see that you can anticipate on this. Uh, a very interesting example um, I spotted recently is provided here. So on the left, you see a tweet from a researcher who just published in Nature, which is of course very nice for this researcher. Um, but apart from having this, this Nature paper, which is usually quite challenging to, to dig through and really to feel and, and know what, what it actually means, especially now at the time of the pandemic, was put into context. And on the right, there's a, a second tweet. So in the, in the, uh, you can see in the text that it says one slash 16. So it means it's a thread. It's this, um, yeah, a sequence of, of small tweets of small messages. And um, this researcher actually put it in context by providing a newspaper article say like, look, we've been looking into this new uh, lineage of SARS-CoV-2 virus. And this might be associated with uh, transmissibility or mortality, and it's put into context right from the start. Up next, other papers were cited, some um, more understandable uh, information was actually provided with it. But what, what was really interesting, I thought as well, is that also the data and also the um, the code was also provided. So this is really a trend that's been, um, yeah, more, more and more popular and uh, kind of formed a critical mass now that not just communicating your results, but also communicating your data and communicating your code is part of the research process for transparency and communication. Um, also co-authors were tagged, uh, funders were tagged. So I thought it was a really good example to kind of really share and show what you've done as a researcher, where usually you're just doing your work, submitting your paper and that's it. Now you can really um, show it and connect with your colleagues or you can connect with colleagues from different fields or with journalists. So there's a lot of opportunity um, to, to connect and share. Here I, I kind of list um, the different uh, aspects of this. So you can, this was already a publication but you can also share your preprint for example in uh, advance. Um, so this is at the stage where you usually submit your manuscript to a journal, you can submit it to a preprint server. You can share your code and maybe if it's possible so your data on GitHub. Um, you can also link up your uh, peer review uh, work that you've done for other journals and which is something that's new for um, uh, relatively new for, for scientists is the alt metric. We talk a lot about citations and impact factors, but the alt metric is actually taking track of keeping track of your um, uh, spread of your information. So is it being picked up by news outlets? Is it being a blog to them? Is a, are there any tweets? And you can really easily kind of track where uh, your research is going, which is really interesting to see like, okay, who's reading my stuff? And, and uh, maybe you can promote it a bit. And, um, it's another way to see um, how your research could have made an impact on, on real life. So I spoke a little bit about preprints and which I thought it was really interesting when I first uh, gave this talk on, on preprints. At that point it was still very novel and I think with um, SARS-CoV-2 we really got to that tipping point where we thought okay we cannot wait for a couple of months of peer review um for these results to come out on the other hand we've also seen the effects of unreviewed work being out there so it's really a balance between um having the scientific process out in the public um which is good because it's kind of like an open peer review process but it can also be quite challenging because sometimes um bits of information that are incorrect or just half correct um, are already being picked up by the news so it's a balance but I think in general, um, we've seen so far that um, the speed of accessibility of information has been very, um, yeah, very, very, very good in, 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 that, yeah, in that sense. And that usually the self-correcting process of science works very well. It can be very confusing for the public though. 
Um, so this is something to, to take into account. Uh, also, if you share your preprints, if you, you, you talk about it, so it's good to kind of be active on the, on the recommendation that it's really a preprint and it's unreviewed so far. Um, today I learned that we're actually competing now with this talk, so thank you for being here because right now the EMA is giving a new update on um, the AstraZeneca vaccine for uh, yeah, against uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection and uh, against the COVID-19 disease. And a couple of weeks ago there was the first talk, the first press conference uh, about um, the potential uh, link with the very rare side effects, with very severe side effects of the AstraZeneca vaccine. And I put it in here because I think it was a very good example of how you can also mix uh, media again. So you can watch the press conference in many different ways. You can um, go to your traditional news outlets and read about the findings they share. You can go live to YouTube to, to view all this, but also on Twitter, for example, uh, the EMA um, announces these press conferences in advance. And um, our very own Jess also provided a live tweet session last time. I don't know if you, you want to share about your motivation or your um, experience with this live tweeting a little bit. It would be very interesting to, to hear. Yeah, sure. So um, this, this was one of these um, issues, I think, that was maybe of, of extreme interest and importance, not only to the epidemiology community, but also to the community at large. And there was a lot of confusion surrounding um, what was going on with AstraZeneca in the media, especially on social media. And I think for those of us who are interfacing both with other scientists, but also members of the general public on social media, there were a lot of calls to explain a bit better um, some of these messages that were coming out. I actually think that Ima in this press conference did a very good job at communicating clearly. I was very impressed by that. And I think the more people that can, let's say, amplify this type of messaging in an understandable way, the better. And so that's why I decided um, to, to live tweet. And it actually, it got a lot of engagements. People wrote me a lot of messages to ask questions and I could refer them to additional information. So I think it, it plays an important role in clarifying, let's say, otherwise potentially confusing messaging that's out there. Uh, thanks for sharing it. It's really um, brave, of course, I think, to, to take that first step and get out there. And, and I'm happy to hear you had a positive um, experience of it, doing that. This is something that's also started during conferences when people were attending conferences and you could sort of share the findings that were presented if it was allowed to share them and um, yeah I think it's very very interesting way to to really connect with a lot of people on, on the topic. So moving into the field of science communication a little bit more I think there were two very um, cool examples when we just um, started the to, to enter the, the, the pandemic one year ago um, at that point at the beginning, it was very new. There was this virus that was coming our way, but very soon this flatten the curve message came out. And I'm pretty sure everybody has heard this message, um, but it was quite challenging to deliver in a way because at some point you think, okay, uh, it's not about completely preventing infection. It's about preventing an overburdened health system. And I think these two, um, you might have seen these two, these two graphics were, were quite funny. So on the left, there was a tweet by um, Anne-Marie Darling who said, well, cats are very popular on, on the internet. Maybe we can do something with this curve and um, link cats to it. So she uh, proposed the cat and the curve uh, hashtag and this graphic where the high peak of, of new infections was um, kind of metaphorically present, represented by an alert cat who was standing up and was being a bit more aggressive. Uh, well, if you can have a lazy cat which is laying down, it's a bit more relaxed. And I think it was a funny way to, to communicate this science. And on the right, there was a, a professional collaboration actually between an illustrator and uh, um, a very uh, good science communicator also on this flat the curve message who created all the visuals, which was quite um, useful to, to spread this message. It was interesting when I looked up this um, 
this gift for this talk. Um, I actually read that um, as much as she uh, learned and, and appreciated this whole attention around her science communication, she actually regretted this curve because she's, she's based in Australia and she said in the end I would have said we should have crushed the curve. <laughs> this is something I recently learned. Um, but I think it's still a very, very powerful message. And another example is this, uh, the, Swiss, the Swiss cheese model, or in Dutch, the Gatenkaas model. Um, <laughs> as I'm Dutch, uh, I cannot uh, not comment on cheese. Um, but this is an, um, an adapted version of a risk communication or accent causation model uh, from the 90s already, where um, the message is really to say, OK, look, We've got this whole set of interventions that you can take or we can take as a community and none of them is perfect. Uh, so every slice has holes in them basically and that uh, the virus can go through it. But if you put them all together, the set of intervention is really, really, really effective and maybe even perfect at preventing the spread of disease. And um, what I'm showing is this is already the third version of this uh, graph. It's being picked up by many, many uh, news outlets, um, public health institutes. Um, it's been translated to a lot of uh, a lot of different languages, and this is all taking place online. This is really people who um, saw this and say, "Hey, okay, I speak Portuguese. I will uh, translate it into Portuguese, for example." Um, so it was a great way to see how social media can really contribute to it. Um, I've been giving a lot of examples right now, and I'm not actually going to answer an example, which is kind of a personal um, experience I had with um, science communication, if you will. Um, as you can see here, we, we kind of track the uh, pandemic, or at least the first wave, with the emojis that have been used on Twitter. It's really insane to see this. So you've got the masked emoji that came up, and also the, the germ emoji that came up. Um, during the first wave uh, early March last year. And you can already see um, the uh, kind of the, the syringe emoji coming up by the end of 2020, where the vaccine started to be um, approved. Um, interestingly, the emoji with the mask, the, flag, the, 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 the smiley with the mask, was changed. And what, what did they change? It was actually an ill uh, person with a mask. And now because healthy people are wearing masks, they thought, well, okay, maybe we can actually um, make the, smi uh, the smiley that's behind the mask a bit more uh, happy. So this is actually something they changed to kind of visually communicate it a little bit better. And this was actually January 1st this year. I think it's, it's, it's a rare, <laughs> rare event for me to, um, you know, engage on, on this time of things on the 1st of January after you, this is, the most boring New Year's Eve ever. Um, but I was thinking, well, it's actually really nice that we have these vaccines coming up, but this emoji is horrible. It's this blood dripping syringe. Um, we need something more positive. This is really the year of hope where vaccines can be such a powerful tool to, to bring us back to normal life. So I started tweeting a bit. I thought, well, can we just get rid of the blood dripping emoji and, and, and maybe change it a bit? And I started Googling and I found this um, this sort of smiling, positive emoji, and I uh, thought, that well, maybe we can do this. So I started to get some attention, and uh, I thought, well, maybe let's add a poll. Do we want to have the same emoji, the syringe, but then just without the blood and all the crazy things that, that are not uh, suitable for a vaccine? Or do we want a new emoji? And then people kind of vote, it's like, well, maybe we want a new emoji. Well, my brother-in-law uh, happens to be a designer, and I was writing him over WhatsApp, like what could this look like and he proposed this um this you've got this strengthy this, this, this arm that is sort of showing his muscle and he said well maybe the band-aid is a good one because this is actually what it looks like if you just received a vaccine so we put it out there on the on the 6th of january so it was all just a bit i don't know just having fun a little bit until a newspaper actually picks it up and um for those that know it, this is the NRC. This is one of the main uh, Dutch newspapers, and it was on the backside of the Saturday night edition. And a uh, Saturday, uh, yeah, Saturday edition. And I would have never, 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 never thought this would happen. And apart from kind of shameless self-promotion of this emoji, which is for me still a hobby project, kind of, um, it has a very serious message to you as well. That is really, if you tweet something, it is out there. 
and um, for good and for bad. So keep in mind, e even if you don't have a crazy amount of followers, I don't have a crazy amount of followers. These tweets have also not really been shared thousands of times, not at all. But a lot of people are uh, actually looking at it. And uh, also a lot of journalists, especially on Twitter, is it just very uh, typical for journalists, are looking into content. So if you have something to share, share it. And it might be picked up, but also be aware because it might be picked up. So this is kind of the, the two-fold message I want to share. Well, to finish off the story, um, later on in February and March, we actually started to see messages from first Apple and then also um, Twitter and Google who started to remove the blood from the serene. So we kind of hope that we have contributed to this new trend. Um, I think there were more people who have this idea because this um, syringe was being shared more and more. Um, but I was happy to see that um, yeah, the visual communication has now uh, improved a little bit, even though it would be nice to maybe get rid of the needle because a lot of people are um, pro-vaccine, but not really a big fan of needles. As I said, um, it's very, social media are a very powerful tool for activism actually and for advocacy and don't underestimate what you can do by sharing your stories. Um, the Me Too, the hashtag Me Too has been world news since years now. It's been the first time that um, people, it, it originated years ago when people started to share whether they had any experience with sexual harassment or sexual assault and it was a way to show how many people actually experienced this and it was a bit more real for people to really see how often this actually takes place. Um, a very uh, recent one is the, the Black Lives Matter movement which also took place during the last year and especially because now a lot of people are at home watching the news and um, this really really um, blew up. Um, it was already there that the whole hashtag and the movement for Black Lives Matter but after the killing of George Floyd this was really um, explosive and so many stories came out, so much attention came um, for this topic um, and this is really activism that has been put online and followed by demonstrations elsewhere but also really really online. Um, the same more recent uh, applies for uh, Sarah Everett um, who was murdered when she was out on the streets and for the stop Asian hate hashtag is also one that's now being used um, so these are very, very serious topics that I, I just wanted to touch upon because it's so important to, to mention this in the context of, of social media um, because they really played a big role in, in these movements. On um, a more practical note, um, I'm just giving a lot of examples of things you can do and maybe plant some seeds in your head about how you can use social media in, in your everyday life or maybe think about it for projects or institutionalize it. Um, there are more and more people who are organizing courses um, online. Um, and we all know the MOOCs probably, the, the online uh, courses, the e-learnings you can do, but there's also a way to do it through Instagram. And I think it's really nice because this is something uh, a lot of people already use, like a lot of people go through their Instagram over breakfast, for example. And there's this uh, initiative of um, an A&E doctor who's now providing uh, A&E courses through Instagram. So you can, get a, uh, you can buy a ticket and you get access to an account. And then throughout the week, you receive these videos of um, how to resuscitate basically, or how to use an AED machine. And I thought it was a very nice way to really make it super accessible to learn something about health or public health um, in a way that people are already used to consume this type of information. Um, and um, yeah, without having to really log into new platforms or making it more difficult. This of course depends a lot on where your target audience is. If your target audience is not on Instagram, then Instagram is not your place to go. Another one, is podcasts. Um, on the left, you've got this podcast will kill you, which is one about all types of infectious diseases. Um, the free associations uh, podcast might be a very interesting one for this audience because it's all about epidemiology and biases. It's basically like a journal club, but then through a podcast. Um, for the um, German speaking audience, uh, the coronavirus update with Christian Drosten is very well known for the international audience is very 
important virologist here in Germany, uh, very active in the um, COVID-19 response and uh, the Dutch version, so to say, but this is virus Biden, where also a, um, an intensive care specialist and a virologist share a lot of information. So all this sharing and showing and presenting yourself is something that's also looked down upon. Um, I also received comments sometimes from people who said, you tweet too much and why do you do all these things? Um, and of course, it's good to be aware of your credibility and what you know. And this is just a, something I put in there uh, because I thought it was funny and I, and I encountered it online at some point that what is, for example, your Kardashian index? So we've already talked about impact factors or citations or alt metrics to measure your impact online. And this is someone who uh, kind of developed a, um, a tool. You can, you can go to this website if you want and you can enter your Twitter handle, you can enter your Google Scholar profile and it will calculate an index. And it kind of says that if this index is under five, I was calculated myself, I was a four, so I'm still safe according to this measure or this metric uh, that you're kind of the, the balance between what you actually do in terms of um, research output is sort of balanced with science communication. I'm not sure if I agree with this because I think science communication as a profession by itself is really enough. Um, but I still wanted to put it out there to share it. Um, another argument for being online. Um, it's so important to ensure trust as a scientist that I think at this point we, we, I mean, trust is something you need to earn, but it's also something you can build and you can build trust with your audiences through sharing what you do. And I thought it was really interesting to share this study. It was actually a randomized controlled trial through Instagram where they assessed if it matters, if scientists are on a picture with their experiment or not when they communicate about their work. So you can see it here. On the right, you see the same picture, the same post, um, and somebody explaining the experiment. Um, because we always tend to focus a lot on what are you doing, how it works, what's the technical mechanism behind it, and all these kind of things. Um, but this study really shows through randomization, everything by the book for the randomized controlled trial, that those pictures, those people who receive pictures with the scientists and the experiments compared to just the experiment were considered as warmer, more trustworthy, and no less competent, so equally competent as, as, as the one without them, and less exclusively male. And I thought it was very important to share this to see how important it is to put yourself out there and show how diverse scientists are, for example, epidemiologists are, and um, there's no, shame in posting pictures of yourself and, and communicating about it, your work because it will actually help to build trust. Um, this was a lot about communicating with um, to the general public actually, but also with your colleagues. It's very important to, to connect, of course, and we always have conferences for that. And even during conferences, it's, it's nice to tweet or maybe follow conferences from um, your home, you can often uh, follow a lot of that um, online, um, but especially now that conferences are taking place completely online, um, it's nice to connect a bit more. I think we all miss these receptions or having a drink or two together, and there's, I guess, no substitute for that, but you can still connect with each other if you put yourself out there, if you share your work um, and put links to other types of work you're doing. Um, provide pictures, um, mention others, link up, tag other people. You can really connect and build a community online. Another interesting example um, of what social media brought for public health, and especially epidemiologists and all kinds of sciences, is that um, there is more interaction between different disciplines but also with data scientists. The data science community, um, often coming from a more commercial background, um, is very used to sharing code online, for example, and, and, and anticipating in um, blog discussions. And there is so much content online and it's very 
easy to access uh, and ask questions online if you get stuck with a certain analysis. And the hashtag Aristats is a really good one. It's uh, for those who work with R, it's an open source uh, software. So it's very, very, uh, yeah, there's a very strong community for data science. And I think uh, the crossover with epidemiology is very good. And one of the good examples is uh, Tidy Tuesday, which is a weekly project that uh, puts a data set online. And every week they say, okay, here is this data set. We have a paper or something that's already been communicated about it. And just go ahead and um, play around with the data and especially the ggplot, which is the uh, really the graphics package from, from our stats. So this is a way to kind of practice and, and build your competence with R and um, also a way to, to network with others. So a lot of people um, participate in this on a weekly basis. So every week you've got the same data set um, they uh, all produce some sort of graph. It can be a super simple graph up until these complete pieces of art people produce. It's really everything in between, and it's all okay. So it's a quite nice, quite a nice way to, um, yeah, practice your skills and, and share it online. At the same time, it's also a great way to uh, share your failures, for example. So sometimes things go completely wrong, and it's absolutely fine to to share this online and kind of you know, have your fourth uh, rejection of your paper you submitted somewhere and, and share it. And, and, and it's nice to have a bit of a support community online. Um, on the right here, there's this account shit my reviewer says, which posts just the most horrible reviewer comments people receive. But I mean, at least it's entertaining to, um, to, to follow it and, and kind of, share failure or share uh, the misery people go through sometimes when they work academically. Uh, another way to build a community um, is the Twitter book club. Uh, Bamke also has a very nice book club nowadays and it's really nice also to see uh, Dr. Ali Murray who started this a couple of years ago every summer and I think also every winter she um, picks a book and um, with everybody who wants to uh, you can join the uh, book up online. So every week she's tweeting about this and people are engaging and people are sharing their, uh, their questions and also their insights from the book. So it's a really nice way to, to learn a little bit about epidemiology, but also have fun. And I think she does really well building a community um, through that. And um, yeah, I was starting to, to end it. And to the, the end of my talk, this is, these are also two accounts which I thought that are of interest of this uh, community. One is relatively risky. So this is just an account who basically shares um, miscommunication on certain topics. For example, they say, <clears throat> still doubled during the first wave of COVID-19 pandemic, while the relative risk was actually quite small, for example. And it tweets all these kinds of examples. Um, there's also an account just says in mice, which um, shares all these types of research that enter headlines, um, but they're actually just mouse model studies, for example. There's also one just one uh, just says in rats, which is uh, tweeting on on rats. So these are just a bit of the the, the fun hangout kind of sides of things, which can be quite nice to um, to join online. Um, so this is all great fun, but um, there are also a lot of disadvantages, of course, uh, when you talk about social media, and I, I cannot really go into the depths of this right here, right now. Um, but I'm sure we're all, we've all been in this situation where people thought, okay, look, I found all this information that all scientists have missed. Um, and also the topic of fake news, it's really, can be really, really hard to, um, yeah, disentangle the, all this information that's out there at this moment. Um, I can really recommend this, this uh, fact check sheet on the left, how to spot fake news. It's available in many languages, um, which really helps people with, um, yeah, basically the news literacy to see like, is it a trusted source? Check the author, what are the resources? What is the date? Was it actually a joke? Um, what's behind this to kind of fight this, this um pandemic of misinformation basically or more information um the we, who also um 
took on a lot of work on this. Uh, the infodemic is called. They uh, do a lot of work on uh, informa providing good information online and in many different platforms. And they are also building a research agenda for the to manage the infodemic that's going on. It's not just the infodemic for uh, fake news. It's also about all this research that's coming out, which is just not, it's impossible to keep up with all the, the new science that's coming out and also filter all that and then also communicate all that. And sometimes there are also information voids, which create a lot of room for conspiracy theories or misinformation to be out there. Um, they also designed uh, a training in, in infodemic management. And there's now a second call out for, for applications. Um, but also a lot of studies are, are being uh, designed right now to really track um, what's possible uh, to really analyze the data from uh, social media to really look into what's actually happening online. Here are two um, examples of this for uh, social media monitoring. On the left, there's a platform which is now being piloted with WHO. So this is an AI supported response tool uh, for social listening. And what it does, it really scrapes social media from the web and um, presents it in a dashboard where you can select countries or populations or platforms and really look what people are communicating about. For example, if people talk about vaccines, are they talking about schools? Is it about transmission? Is it about travel? So with that, you can really think, okay, maybe we should communicate a bit more on this or let's take a look what people are communicating about. And at the same time, ECDC also um, uh, created this Epi Twitter uh, tool for uh, scraping of, of Twitter data to use it for epidemic intelligence, also to maybe um, detect new outbreaks, for example, or rumors or something that's going on in the community and really take a data-driven approach to um, epidemic intelligence. So this was a enormous list of all the possibilities, which is not exhaustive. And I, I really did not mention a lot of uh, the aspects of social media, but I hope still um, that I've shared some interesting insights around this topic. Um, in general, it's, it's, a, it's a powerful multi-tool social media. There are different platforms that are part of our world right now, um, if you want it or not. There's no need to take part in everything, but it's good to be aware of these mechanisms and um, also think about how you can maybe integrate this into your workflow as a scientist, because the science are uh, evolving. Um, there's endless possibility for the integration, um, also with communicating your work. And it has also its disadvantages. That's really something to acknowledge. I did not even start talking about, for example, different algorithms that are behind social media platforms, but there are very, um, this is a very dynamic uh, field of work. Um, you can use it though as a, as a tool for public health monitoring, for surveillance, for your research, and also to really um, connect with your communities. And so it's good to keep in mind that we're really in this pandemic and an epidemic at the same time. Um, you could tell probably that I, I talk a lot about Twitter because I think this is for this is a very interesting platform for epidemiologists to attend. And if you're keen on, on uh, checking it out, if you're not on Twitter yet, uh, there's this very nice book online um, where you can read a little bit about how you could get started on, on Twitter as a scientist. Um, and at the end, I just want to acknowledge a lot of people I spoke with about this topic to kind of build um, where I am today speaking about this topic. Um, but most of all, thank you for joining and I'm happy to take questions or discuss things further. Great, thank you so much, Sonia. Um, the entire room of attendees is clapping loudly uh, from behind their, their computer screen. So um, really, really appreciate your talk. I think you've covered so many interesting points and I know that um, based on the amount of chat messages I've received and the, the questions coming in in the Q&A, I think there's a lot we can discuss here. Also um, in light of some of the examples you've shared.